I thank the organizers for putting this this together. I, I I wasn't planning to come to the talks this week. I was just planning to like pop in for mine, but like they've been awesome and it's really cool to have everyone together, even though we're all over the place. Um, okay, so yes, this final talk I promised it was going to be kind of a different flavor, and so that flavor is big. Um, and so we're going to talk about big mapping class groups. And so I want to give um, the references for this, this talk a little bit different from the last two. Uh, so for this, I want to highly recommend this survey article by Javier and um, Nick. So it's called Big Mapping Class Groups and Overview. It's available on the archive. And then there's also this nice set of notes that Nick Blomis wrote up after the AIM workshop on infinite type services and big mapping class groups, like I guess a year ago or so. Um, so these are available on his website. Um, yeah, so these are great, great resources to look at if you're interested in these things. Okay, so just to uh, get us started, um, we're going to talk about big surfaces. And so by that, I mean surfaces of infinite type. I was originally planning to draw these, and then I realized I'm not that fast at drawing. <laughs> so I'm just going to throw up some pictures from a few different papers that I enjoy on the, this topic. So first off, we have, let me... See if I can use my, my pointer. So we have an example of, here's a surface. This is often called um, the spotted Loch Ness monster. It's this surface with an infinite amount of genus, um, an infinite number of isolated punctures. They're all accumulating out to one end. We have this, um, it's often called the tripod surface. So it has three ends accumulated by genus. And so this comes from this paper of uh, Matt Durham, Federica Pannoni, and Nick Blomis about actions of infinite types, um, actions of mapping class groups of infinite type surfaces on complexes of curves. Here's another picture. So this is similar to a tripod, but now we have five ends accumulated by genus. Um, another paper that we'll talk about a little bit of one of the results from this paper a little bit later on is this paper of Jesus Fernandez Hernandez, Isil Morales, and from Valdez. And I just picked these pictures because they're cool. <laughs> they look like these like octopus or something. Um, so these are examples of, of, so here on the left, we have a surface that's kind of infinitely branching out, has all these um, ends. And then here we have where we kind of keep putting genus in as we go along. We have, kind of have this mixed genus and punctures action going on. Um, another really cool paper um, is of Juliet Bavard and Alden Walker. And they look at the this surface, which is, um, there's tons of different infinite type surfaces, but you know the special ones because they have names. Uh, this is one is called the blooming canter tree. Um, and so you have like a sphere minus a canter set, but then you're also accumulating out each end with genus. Okay. So again, here's, here's my Loch Ness monster. I don't have the spotting anymore. It's just like infinite genus accumulating out to one end. Um, and this one, this one at the bottom is called, um, this one is called the ladder surface. So you just have um, genus accumulating out in two directions. Um, let me add another page. <laughs> okay, cool. So one thing that we these surfaces all have in common is that we're now allowing for, like I mentioned before, like just an infinite amount of genus, an infinite number of punctures. I'm not going to consider surfaces with boundary. Um, some people do. I don't like to, especially not in the infinite type surface case. It just throws in extra kind of complications. Okay. But luckily for us, we do have an actual classification here. So similar to the one that I outlined, um, I guess on Monday. Oh, let me not do this. Uh, so we have a classification of surfaces, which lets us make sense of all of the different things that can arise here. So. This is the classification of infinite type surfaces. Okay. So this is a theorem that is attributed to two people. Um, Kirk and Richards. Um, but if you want to look up a reference, you should look up the paper of Richards. Okay. And so 
this says it's kind of similar in spirit to the classification for finite type surfaces. It's going to give us a surface. It's kind of three parameters to determine our surface of infinite type. It's determined up to homeomorphism um, by three things. So again, we want to look at its genus. So here now, though, it's not the genus isn't necessarily finite. It's going to be some natural number or, or infinite. Um, and then we're going to consider its space of ends. And the subspace of ends that are accumulated by genus. So they have kind of this extra decoration. So now we have that a surface of infinite type S is really determined by these three pieces of information. So we have our surface. Uh, we have the genus, we have the um, end space, and then we have this kind of distinguished subspace of the space of ends um, determined by, um, accumulated by genus. Okay, I think I made my pen a little too big. Okay. So I've mentioned <laughs> kind of very importantly these spaces of ends, right? But I haven't said what they are, but luckily for us, if you are in the last lecture, Riley defined the, what ends are, um, what the ends of a topological space are, which is awesome because I am not brave enough to <laughs> write down anything that has to do with an inverse limit or anything like this. So I was not planning to define it. And so I'm just gonna give you um, a picture just to, if you weren't in, in my these lecture, that's fine because um, I'm just gonna give a picture motivation or idea of it instead. Okay, so what, I, what am I meaning when I say ends? And so my explanation is just going to come in the form of a picture, or rather like an example. So look at Z and Z2, right, as groups. And we can consider uh, KV graphs for these. So here's one for Z. Here's one for Z2. Right, this one, is, these are extending out. And we can think of the space of ends by thinking of kind of how we can disconnect this space. The, the way that I like to think of it informally is that the space of ends, these are kind of the ends of the ways of going to infinity. This is, of course, a very informal and precise thing. But I think morally, this is the, a good way to think of it. And so here for Z, we have this, this Cayley graph. If you remove any like segment in the middle, you're gonna disconnect it into two pieces, right? No matter how big of a segment you remove, you're gonna get two plate pieces. And in fact, we have that Z has, has two ends. It's a two-ended group. Whereas if we look at the Cayley graph with Z2, you can kind of delete bigger and bigger pieces like surrounding the origin, and you're always going to have that connected piece around the edge, right? You're gonna just have a single piece left over. And so even though in some sense, <laughs> the Z2 Cayley graph kind of looks like it has many ways of going off, really you're always going to the same place. We just have one end here. Okay. So this is kind of my motivation for what I mean when I'm talking about the space events. And we already saw that when we were looking at the pictures earlier, right? Like we looked at that tripod surface and you saw, saw kind of the three directions that were accumulated by genus, your three, three different ends. Okay, awesome. Okay, so great. We, we have an idea now of what our infinite type surfaces are. So now we can go back to what we're all here to talk about, which is the mapping class group. Okay. Well, we're gonna actually define the mapping class group exactly the way we did 
for a finite type surface. So the mapping class group is again just my group of orientation preserving homeomorphisms of my surface up to homotopy. And this is now when S is infinite type. This is when I introduce my, my moniker that I like to use, which is um, the big mapping class group, right? So this is my big, big MCG. Okay. Cool. Okay. So all of these homeomorphisms of surfaces that we talked about yesterday, right, we can still see here, right? We still have, like, you can kind of take, like, a rigid space rotation of our surface. We can still do dang twists, right? Anything that is supported on a compact surface we can do on a compact piece of our, our infinite type surfaces. But it would be cool if we had um, some examples of things that we don't see in the finite type setting. And so I'm just going to give, uh, oops, I'm going to give one such example, which we'll also uh, use later on. So um, so homeomorphism of infinite type surface. And so the one that I want to introduce is one that's called a handle shift. And so this is something that we can do on a surface when we have an infinite amount of genus. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a um, drip that has a countable collection of handles marching along on it. Okay, so let me. See if I can do this. I'm not as good at Riley as at manipulating my pictures yet. Um, okay, so I have my two things. And so what is my handle shift? It's move them over by, and you could choose different embeddings of this strip into your surface. So, you know, you could have these handles kind of weaving around through other handles. Um, so these are, oops, back to my pen. These are of course infinite strips. You could have these handles, these strips actually, instead of going from two different ends, you could have them coming kind of from one end and just marching back to it, this kind of loop type thing. And what we could also do is instead of having handles, you could just think of having this strip having some disk sitting in it. And you could choose what kind of topo like complicated topology you put into this disk. And so you could, you could introduce different sort of um, what I'll call shift maps by allowing different things to live in those kind of disks. Okay. So these are great. These are handy. These are things that do not live in compact surfaces. So this is a good example of something that we are a new phenomena that we're introducing in the infinite types um, setting. So let me just write that here. This does not live on any compact subsurface. Awesome. So here's here's a good example to, to keep in mind when we're thinking about these things. Okay. So now let's let's give some 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 fun facts about the big mapping class group. Uh, there's a question. Uh, how do we know that this handle shift isn't homotopic to the identity? Uh, you can see its action on on this arc right here, right? This this curve is not homotopic to itself under the action of the the handle shift. I I should mention that really my action is tapered to the identity on the kind of the edges of this strip, so that that's fixed, and then the the middle part is sliding. So you might think like you're just moving like an annulus along, but you're not. You're taking like a strip, like you could say on the top of an annulus and sliding it. So your curves are not going to be homotopic to themselves. Um, a curve won't be homotopic to its image, I guess, under this handle shift. OK. So what are my fun facts aimed to do? My fun facts are aimed to convince you that 
Um, these mapping classes groups really are big. Like sure, all my surfaces are big, but how do I know my, that my group is? Okay. So throughout this, you don't need to pay too much mind to this. I'm not going to get into any proofs that really require us to understand this topology, but just so that what I'm saying makes sense, there is a, a natural topology you can put on this. Um, uh, map S. Oops, I wrote that backwards. So I'm just going to equip it with the compact open topology. And then if you were here, <laughs> Right before my talk, you might have already heard some of these, these facts. So this, I'm going to state these as, as a stem. So for every, infinite type surface, S, we have the following. So first off, the mapping class group is not locally compact. Um, two, not only, right? So we know that in the finite type setting that the mapping class group is finitely generated, right? We actually gave a finite generating set for it on Monday and proved that it was finite. Well, sketch the proof that it was finitely generated. Not only does the mapping class group of an infinite type surface fail to be finitely generated, um, but in fact, it's not even compactly generated. Not compactly generated. And then finally, if you still were not convinced that this makes it a big group, it turns out that map S is homeomorphic to the bare space and then. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't actually mean that much to me either, but that bare space is homeomorphic to R minus Q. So that means more to me. So in particular, right, these groups are, this kind of punchline for me at least, on countably infinite. So these definitely deserve to be called big, okay? So I feel like I, I have justified myself to you to some extent. So now I just want to mention a, a couple of interesting subgroups that we have for this mapping class group. And some of these might be f familiar to you if you thought about um, finite type mapping class groups. So some interesting subgroups. I feel like especially with, we always like as group theorists, I feel like we always want to know about subgroups, but I feel like for a group this big, it feels even more comforting if we can get our hands on something that we um, understand. Okay, so oh, let me first do. So this kind of got mentioned in passing yesterday. Someone mentioned, maybe not yesterday, maybe Monday. Someone mentioned the Berman exact sequence and I kind of wrote this down on one of the slides. But this is just my subgroup um, of the mapping class group that consists of elements uh, fixing the space of ends. So for finite type surfaces, you can think of this for surfaces with punctures. It's going to be the subgroup of the mapping class group that like fixes the, the punctures pointwise. 
So here we're fixing the space of ends. Okay. And then sitting inside the mapping class group, uh, the pure mapping class group, we have this subgroup called the Trelli group. And this consists of elements acting trivially on homology. So this is a group that gets a lot of attention for finite type surfaces. And there are some cool things known about it um, in the infinite type setting as well. So this is the Trelli group. Uh, so this is like the pure, pure mapping class group. Okay. And then here is a, a, a subgroup that we definitely don't think about in the finite type setting. So this also sits inside the pure mapping class group. And this is the subgroup of the mapping class group, which consists of um, elements with compact support. Okay. And actually, this, this subgroup can be written. So this is the only time I'll write a direct limit during this talk. But this, this can be written as the direct limit of the mapping class group of um, essential compact subsurfaces. So let me just write that down. So this is a direct limit of um, taken overall essential uh, compact. Uh, subsurfaces of S ordered by inclusion. So of course, in the finite type setting, the whole mapping class group is compactly supported because a finite type subsurface, as finite type surfaces um, are compact. Well, if you don't have punctures. Um, Okay, cool. So these are, yeah, these are things, we'll touch on some of these a bit more. Oh, I should write down what this is. So this is just compactly supported. Um, we'll touch on some of these a bit more as we go through. So I just wanted to bring that up here. I hear someone unmuting, is there a question? Um, can, can you once more mention the relation between the last two you wrote, the direct limit? Yeah, the, 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 the two in the bottom. Oh, so these are equal. You're talking about these two? Yeah, so what's map, what's map X exactly? Oh, sorry. So this is just taken over. This is a direct limit taken over all essential compact subsurfaces. I should guess I should say X of S. So this is just, yeah, sorry. I didn't actually see what X is. But these are just the essential compact subsurfaces. So like the elements with compact support live in this in this direct limit. Thank you. Okay, so what, what can we say about a group like this, a group that's so big, right? Can we say anything um, kind of meaningful about its a generating set, for, for example, right? Um, this is kind of the flavor of questions that we asked for the finite tape setting. And we already know that the, our hope of finite generation is out the window. Um, but maybe there is something meaningful we can say. Okay. So let's explore this a little bit. And just as a reminder, right, we have, we already said that this is not finitely generated. And we explored just a few slides back that this is not even um, compactly generated. But it turns out, so this is um, a result of Pri and Patel and Nick Flamis, that we can say something, at least in some cases, about generating set. 
So here, right, we're in this topological group. So we can say something about um, a topological generating set, right? Which means that uh, maybe our elements don't arise as products of the elements, but maybe they arise as like limits of products of the elements in our generating set. Okay, so I also want to mention that I first started thinking about imminent type surfaces and big mapping class groups. I became interested in this because Priam gave a talk about this paper, this result um, at the Red Bud Topology Conference a, a few years ago. So she gave an excellent, excellent talk. And it was so engaging that I, I started, um, it's really sparked my interest, as you can tell by the fact that I'm giving this talk right now. <laughs> okay, so um, what is their statement? So the, this theorem has kind of two pieces. So first, if our surface has um, at most one end accumulated by genus, then we get the following. So this, this result is for um, the pure mapping class group. Then this pure mapping class group is generated, again, topologically generated um, by gain twists. So I'll just note that here so we don't forget. This is not, not generally like we think of for, for, in, for finite, finitely generated groups, okay? And then we have the corresponding statement if it has um, um, has at most one end, yeah. Wait, is this the right statement? Yeah, oh, I wrote it wrong in my, in one set of notes. So the next statement is if it has at least one end. So at least two ends accumulated by genus. So if you have at least two ends accumulated by genus, now we have some things that are happening not just with compactly supported mapping class groups. So we have that we're topologically generated now. Um, we still want our Dane twists in there, but we also want now handle shifts. Uh, Marissa, could you clarify what it means for an end to be accumulated by Gina? Yeah, so by an end accumulated by Gina, I, it's like that picture I drew at the beginning, right? Um, I guess I didn't draw it, but like this, right? This, um, what did I call it? Like the punctured Loch Ness Monster. So this is an example where we have, we have one end sitting out here and we have that it's accumulated by both by genus and by isolated punctures. Um, but we could also just take away this and we just have all this genus marching out. So this is, this is what I mean when I say accumulated by genus. Um, so I, I mean, it's not a planar end. Um, erase this. Okay. Cool. So here now, again, this is still topologically generated. Okay. So this is great. So even though we, like, there's somehow still some nice, like, properties happening here. Even though everything is so big and wild, like Dane twists are super nice. They're like the most familiar and comforting homeomorphism that we know. And even in this case where we have prime more ends accumulated by genus, we knew throw in more things, but somehow the things we knew throw in are still pretty nice, right? They're kind of easy to think about. Um, and yeah, it's good. So this is great. And I just want to mention one kind of um, so this statement together with further work of, so of Javi and also uh, Priam and Nick. So this gets um, upgraded to a countable collection. So that's pretty nice. That's that's the nicest thing that we could hope for in this setting, right? So this gets upgrade an upgrade, thanks to work of um, Javi, Priam, and Nick. 
So this is pretty, this is pretty cool. Um, so of course, there's still lots of room for work, right? Like this is just one subgroup of the mapping class group. We are only looking at considering elements here that are fixing our end space. Um, so there's still lots to think about, but that's pretty kind of hopeful, I guess, that there's kind of nice properties going on. Okay, awesome. So we've just asked a very like kind of basic type of question about the big mapping class group. We asked about what it, what it looks like to generate it. And so now I'm gonna ask another very basic question. that we could ask about any group. And that's, what is the center? Okay. So let's, let's just go ahead and do it. So just as a reminder, since I didn't actually mention this when we were talking about um, small mapping class groups, is that uh, the center is trivial um, for a finite type in the finite type setting. Okay, so in order to think about computing the center, um, I want to introduce a couple of tools. And so the first tool is this tremendously handy result. This is so useful anytime you're really thinking about homeomorphisms of surfaces, honestly. This is, um, I, I use it all the time. And this is called uh, the Alexander method. This deserves a purple bold. It's very important. Okay. And so this, I'll have this as a theorem statement. So this is true for surfaces of um, finite and infinite type. So if S is a non-trivial mapping class, And essentially it gives us like a super combinatorial way of thinking about our homeomorphism, right? If it's non-trivial, then there exists a curve C such that F of C is not equal to C, okay? So this is awesome. Um, and this result was proved, so proved for infinite type surfaces um, this was proved in one of the papers that I mentioned earlier in the talk when I gave some pictures so this was proved by um, Hernandez Hernandez Let me make sure I don't leave off. So, Hernandez, Hernandez, um, Morales. So, Jesus Hernandez, Hernandez Israel Morales, and Fran uh, Valdez. Okay. So, this is awesome. So, this gives us this like kind of combinatorial way for, for thinking about our, our homeomorphisms. Okay. So this is great. So this is one of the tools that I need to compute the center of the mapping class group. Another tool is, this is again, something that we have in the finite type setting. Okay, so here are just a couple of facts about gain twists. So the Alexander method, there was extra work to be done. Um, to show that it holds 
for infinite type surfaces. But because Ding twists are supported on um, compact surfaces, we just get these for free because we have it in the finite type setting. So what are these? So it's just uh, two things. So these are always good to have in your back pocket. So if we take a mapping class F and we let A and B be simple closed curves. Then we have the following. So one, we have this kind of identity property that if we take a Dane twist about A and it's equal to the Dane twist about B, then in fact, this happens if and only if um, A is equal to B. So you're not gonna be twist about two distinct curves and get the same Dane twist. This is great. And the other one is like this conjugation relation. So if we take a Dane twist and we conjugate it by our mapping class, then that's the same as if we took just a twist about the image of our curve by the element that we are conjugating by. Okay. So a good exercise is uh, prove these. And of course, the primer will be an answer key for this. So you should think about it before uh, you look it up. But if you need a reference, you can go look at the primer. Okay, awesome. Okay, so now we actually, we have these two tools. We have our Alexander method. So we have this uh, combinatorial method of detecting whether we have a non-trivial homeomorphism. And we have these two kind of quick facts about Dane twists. And so we're now ready to actually compute the center. So I'll say this is a theorem, although it's more of an observation. So this is myself and um, Justin Lanier. Is that map S has trivial center. So of course, this was already known for finite type surfaces. Um, but the proof is actually identical. Once you have the Alexander method, we can give this pretty much um, the same proof we'll hold in either case. So the proof is nice. So I'll actually write it. I guess this is the first full proof that I'll give in this entire mini course. And it's just a few lines. So that's, that's why I like it. So let's take a non-trivial mapping class, right? So then by the Alexander method, um, there exists a curve C uh, such that F of C is not equal to C, okay? And so now we're gonna use our second Dane twist fact, so our conjugation relation. And we know then that if we conjugate the twist about C by F, we just get the twist about F of C. So now let's assume that F is central. So it's in the center, which means that it commutes with every other element in our group. And that means that this conjugation um, is just equal to T of C, right? We just commute, the Fs cancel out. But this implies then that F of C is equal um, to C of C, and this is a contradiction. Right? Because we already know that F of C is not equal to C. And so by our first kind of identity about Dane twists, we have that this, this can't happen. Okay, so that's the whole proof. So this is really nifty. So we just computed the center of, um, of the mapping class group. Awesome. So we've been thinking a good bit about subgroups, right? We thought about the center. We mentioned um, the pure mapping class group, the Torelli subgroup, the compactly supported subgroup on the mapping class group. Um, 
So is there anything that we can say? I think it's a natural question, right? Um, let me find it right. If we can say anything structurally about subgroups of the mapping landscape. So this is a pretty vague um, question. So I'll make it I'll make it a little bit more explicit. I'll give you an example of something a structural statement we can make about subgroups um, of the mapping class group for finite type surfaces. Okay, so this is a a theorem that is independently due to Ivanov and McCarthy. And so they proved in the finite type world. So if S has finite type, then we get this really nice um, subgroup alternative. Then every subgroup on map S is one of two things. It's either virtually abelian, which means that it has a finite index abelian subgroup, or it contains um, a non-abelian free group. So it contains a copy of F2. Okay, so this, this, this subgroups alternative, this is like pretty well known and it has a name. Um, this is called... Um, you wanna say non-abelian free subgroup, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yes. Uh, yeah, exactly. I wanted, I wanted to be able to contain a copy of FD. Non-abelian free. So this is called, this subgroup alternative is called um, the strong tits alternative. Um, and this is in contrast to the classical tits alternative where instead of having the um, alternative be, be between virtually abelian or containing a copy of F2, it's between virtually solvable and containing a copy of F2. So this is, this is an important theorem. So this is kind of in the spirit of many things when studying um, finite type mapping class groups, which is this is kind of coming from the analogy between mapping class groups and linear groups. Okay, so of course we can naturally ask, does the same thing hold? For infinite type. And the answer is no. So this is um, this is in the same paper with Justin. And we we show more than this. We don't we show not just that this doesn't hold in general for big mapping class groups. We show that um, there is no. No big mapping class group. Yeah. I'm satisfying this strong test alternative. Seems okay. like there should be seems like there should be an easy obstruction or or is it hard to prove here? I'm I'm just curious. No, it's gonna be very easy, very nice. 
Okay, so I was I wanted to go through the whole proof. I think I won't have time, but I'm gonna just give, just give the idea of the proof. And if anyone's curious about like kind of the pictures to further justify it, we can talk about it in office hours um, tomorrow or something. So yeah, like Abdul said, this the obstruction is not too hard to find. So idea of proof. We just need to exhibit a subgroup that is not like not virtually abelian, doesn't contain a free subgroup. And so the one that we're going to choose, why did I just go full screen? The one we're going to choose is one that has been actually mentioned this week already. It's Z with Z. Okay, so this is again just not virtually abelian. No F2. And so the way to build, um, how do we build this? Is to make one kind of crucial observation. So right, we wanna demonstrate that this lives in the big mapping class group of any infinite type surface. And so we, we wanna say something kind of generally about what the space of ends look like because we wanna be able to always find this, this subgroup. And so we're gonna just, have, I'll just say this kind of crucial observation. So observation is that S, um, so S infinite type it satisfies at least one of the following conditions. So one has infinite genus. Two, it has countably many isolated punctures. Or three, it has a candor set of punctures. that are kind of undecorated. So with none of them accumulated by isolated punctures. So in order to prove this, this result very generally, we just need to show it for one thing in each of these in each of these categories, right? And so I'm not going to actually um, go through the details. It's not too hard. It's some nice pictures, but I want to have time to to talk about some open questions. So I'm just going to say this: the idea is just to build a shift map plus twisting, right? So we get our our copy of Z. We get our <laughs> infinite many copies of Z's. And um, so the picture that you can think of, and maybe you can fill in the details yourself, is that we're going to do something like this and take a shift map like this. And we'll fill in different things here, depending on which category we're in, right? We can either put a couple punctures, put a handle, uh, put a canter set. And then we can take a twist about a curve here. And so this picture essentially tells you how to find your Z with Z. Okay. So this is this is the idea. Like I said, if you, you want to talk about it a bit more, um, we can definitely talk about it in office hours, or you could read our paper because it's only like five pages. Um, but I wanna I wanna talk about a few questions um, before we leave off because I promise some open questions. I think one of the really fun things about this area is that there's so many things that we just don't know. So questions.
So the first, oh, the first question um, Justin and I posed. So in our paper, we show that there is examples of big mapping class groups um, that did not satisfy the classical tits alternative, but we weren't able to show that none of them did. So this is actually very recently answered. So I'm just writing it because I wanted, I didn't want to mention our result without, without also mentioning this result. So this is a result of Daniel Alcock. This is forthcoming work. So it's not out yet, but he has given at least one talk. He's spoken like the work geometry topology online seminar about this. Uh, sorry, Marissa, can, can you say one again? I, I don't think I understood what you said. What's that? Um, can you say what? But the first question is again, I don't think I really got one. Oh, yes. So the question is, um, do any big mapping class groups satisfy the, the classical tits alternative? So in our paper, we gave a counterexample to show that they don't all exhibit them. Whenever you have like a cantor set, like an undecorated cantor set, you can construct a Thompson's group. And so that doesn't satisfy the classical tits alternative. But we were only able to show this for specific types of surfaces. And so the question was, are there any which do satisfy the classical tits alternative? And Alcock says, no, they're not. So he, he ends up showing that there is some like quotient of the Gregor Chuck group, which lives inside these big mapping class groups for any, any type of um, infinite type surface. I think I must have misunderstood your theorem. Then can you please go a bit? Like, I thought your theorem said that, um, that no large mapping class group Satisfies. Yeah. So, 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 oh, 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 okay. Okay. So, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Okay, now I sorry. This is the big, this is a, so this is the classical. So, here he's talking about either virtually solvable or containing a non abelian free group. We show that they, there is none with which are virtually abelian or, or but like Z, Z with Z, for example, um, is virtually solvable. So, yeah, that was kind of um, the problem. And like the Thompson scoop we constructed for the counter example, we couldn't find it in any of them. Um, so, yeah, so his construction is really cool. I'm looking forward to his paper coming out. So kind of a related type of question. This was a question um, that Milan imposed. He posed this to Justin when Justin was chatting with him about big mapping class groups and then also posed it at the um, AIM workshop. Um, it's kind of related, this kind of subgroup alternative question. Um, is every uh, subgroup So this is for a specific um, big mapping class group. So this is looking at the surface, which is um, the plane minus the cantor set. Okay. And he proposed the following, are every subgroup either amenable or has So this is a question I'm writing down because it's related to um, this subgroup alternative type question. But I will say that this is outside my depth of expertise. I am not comfortable with either quasimorphisms or amenability. Um, but one thing I will mention is that the mapping class group of uh, finite type settings do have infinite dimensional group of quasimorphisms. And this is a result of Vesfina and Fujiwara. So that's a sort of in that same flavor of subgroup alternatives. Um, another question, this is posed by Javi. There's so many questions. I'm literally just writing down a couple of handfuls just to like give a flavor of like some of the most basic things that we don't know. Um, so this is posed by Javi and <laughs> I just like kept going with Javi's last name. Sorry about that. Let me try again. Um, yeah. Um, and Nick in their survey paper, which again, I cannot recommend highly enough. I think it's a great place to, to look for lots of, lots of questions, so much information all gathered together um, about these big mapping class groups. So here the question is, are mapping class groups of infinite type surfaces Um, Co-Hopian. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I mean, 
is every injective endomorphism of my mapping class group induced by an underlining um, by homeo of the underlying surface. So I didn't write this down, but I believe this is this is true. I know this is true for finite type mapping last groups of finite type surfaces, and I believe it's due to even of McCarthy. Okay, so this is something we don't know. And then a similar question. This is the last one. Um, again, there's so many. I just like I just had to pick some, but this is kind of in the similar flavor of of the one I just mentioned. So this is a question that Javi posed um, at the AIM workshop. And it's this, if we have a, so this is very much in the flavor of work that Javi has done for surface, mapping class groups of finite type surfaces. So if we have a homomorphism between two mapping class groups, does this preserve the notion of compactly supported. So when you have a subjective homomorphism, um, the answer is yes, for um, by work of, of our Dowdle Wafi. But in general, this is the answer to this question is not known. So maybe I should just write that down. So um, yes for subjective homomorphism by work. So this is also a great paper. It's pretty short um, about infinite type surfaces by Bavar, Dowdle, and Rafi. OK. So yeah, that's it. There's, like I said, there's so many more questions, like so many things, like just think of the, your favorite fact about the mapping class group. So many of them are not known. So many things are being done. Like, um, I mean, I think there's a bunch of people in this audience who have proved some really cool things about big mapping class groups. Um, I know Riley had a paper come out recently about Nielsen realization um, for um, these big mapping class group and infinite type services. So there's all sorts of work coming out all the time. Um, and it just leads to more and more questions. And so this is why I wanted to spend this like last lecture on big mapping class groups in particular, just because it's such a fruitful area and there's so many young people especially getting involved. So I super encourage people to, if they enjoy it, to spend some time thinking about this, thinking about questions and, and yeah, hop in, it's, it's fun. Okay, that's all, thanks so much. Okay, uh, let's thank Marissa for an excellent mini course.